Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to be discussing the major classes of diuretic medications. So first of all, diuretic medications are drugs that are used in the treatment of hypertension, but these drugs act at the level of the nephron in the kidneys and attempt to reduce the blood volume by causing excretion of more fluid in the urine. Before we get into all the diuretic drugs, let's briefly review the structure of the nephron. So here's our kidney right here, one of them, and the kidney is composed of thousands and thousands of individual nephrons, and each nephron shown here is a functional unit of the kidney. So here's the most proximal part of the nephron, the glomerulus, which is composed of glomerular capillaries, and the capillaries allow filtration of the blood, and so in this way, the capillaries here allow removal of excess water from the blood, excess ions from the blood, and also waste products. And all of those things end up moving throughout these tubules of the nephron. Some things will remain in there and some things will be reabsorbed along the way. After the glomerulus, we enter this structure which is called the proximal convoluted tubule or the PCT. From there, we enter the nephron loop. So here's the start of the loop, comes down here, loops around and comes back up. This nephron loop is also called the loop of Henle, and it of course has two parts. It has a descending component, which goes down, and then it has an ascending component that comes back up. After the loop of Henle, we have the distal convoluted tubule right here, and then finally over here we have the collecting ducts, and anything that remains in the collecting ducts past this point will end up in the urine and be excreted into the toilet, basically. Now, there are four major classes of diuretic drugs. You can see these written in green at various spots here. And each one of these diuretics is going to act on a different protein that's situated in a different region of the nephron. The first class of drugs we'll look at are the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. So these are obviously drugs that inhibit the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. Now, carbonic anhydrase ultimately allows bicarbonate to be reabsorbed into the blood. So if you see one of these arrows that moves from within the tubule out, that means that that substance is being reabsorbed from the tubule into the blood and it won't be excreted. And so normally, carbonic anhydrase allows the reabsorption of both sodium ions and bicarbonate, HCO3, to be reabsorbed from the tubules into the blood. And so therefore, it's not excreted. Well, what would happen if we inhibited carbonic anhydrase. Well, these two ions, sodium and bicarbonate, will not be able to be reabsorbed. And so sodium and bicarbonate will remain in the tubule system, right, because they're unable to be reabsorbed. So one really important thing here to know for the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and also all the other classes of drugs is water follows salt. This is very important. Wherever the salt is, basically the sodium, water will also be there. So if we did not have the inhibitor and we were reabsorbing sodium bicarbonate, we're reabsorbing sodium, so sodium is going into the blood. So where's water going to go? Water is going to follow it by osmosis into the blood. And so there's going to be less water in the tubule system. But in the case of these inhibitors, where we're not reabsorbing sodium and sodium is staying in the tubules, water is going to also remain in the tubules. So does that make sense why these drugs act as a diuretic? If sodium's remaining in the tubules because it's not being reabsorbed, then water's also going to be in the tubules, and there's going to be more water going through the tubules and more water in the urine. Now, despite the fact that they can be used as diuretic, they're actually the least commonly used of all four of these classes, but they do have some other indications up here. They're, they can be used in people with glaucoma, uh, people with epilepsy or seizure disorder, um, in individuals with mountain sickness to treat the acute effects of that, and also idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Now, generally speaking, the way that we would recognize a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor is most of them end in zolamide, so acetazolamide, methazolamide. Now, there is this exception right here, but when you see that zolamide, that indicates we're using a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. The second class of diuretic is the loop diuretic, and these are one of the most commonly used 
of the four classes. Now the most common of the loop diuretics, the most likely that you'll see is furosemide, which is also called Lasix, that's its trade name. But in general, the loop diuretics are going to inhibit a protein, this transporter here, which is situated in the ascending loop of Henle. So you can see here, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors uh, act at the proximal convoluted tubule. These act at the ascending loop. And this protein is going to facilitate the reabsorption of three ions. So sodium, potassium, and chloride with a ratio of one to one to two. Okay? So it allows the reabsorption of all of these. Now, normally, when we reabsorb sodium, remember, water follows it. So if we reabsorb sodium into the blood, water is going to follow it via osmosis and also be reabsorbed into the blood. Now, technically, the water will be reabsorbed at the descending loop of Henle, but the result is the same. Water follows salt, and so there will be less water in the loop. But what happens if we use a loop diuretic and we inhibit this transporter? Will sodium be reabsorbed? No, it will remain in the loop. Will potassium be reabsorbed? No, it will remain in the loop. And the same thing goes for chloride. All three of these ions remain in the loop. And what of the water? Well, the water will also fail to be reabsorbed because there's more sodium here in the loop and therefore the water will remain in the loop where the sodium is. And so if water remains here, it's gonna continue through the nephron tubules and it will ultimately end up in the urine. So that's how loop diuretics uh, facilitate the excretion of more water. They inhibit this transporter, which allows the sodium to remain in the tubule, and so the water also remains in the tubule and ends up in the urine. Now, one very important indication for loop diuretics is when we're treating hypertension, so high blood pressure, but it is associated with peripheral edema. So there's substantial edema in the extremities. Normally, the legs is where it's going to be most common. Um, as we'll see in a few minutes, the thiazides are also used in hypertension, but without peripheral edema. So if you have a patient that has hypertension and extremities with peripheral edema, most likely they're going to be on a loop diuretic rather than a thiazide drug, okay? The other thing to watch out for with loop diuretics is because they also inhibit the reabsorption of potassium, potassium is also going to remain in the loop and be excreted in the urine, and so we run the risk of hypokalemia, so deficient sodium in the blood. Okay, That's another thing we'll also see with the thiazide drugs. So loop diuretics treat hypertension with peripheral edema. And that leads us to the thiazide drugs. The thiazide drugs act on a protein that we find in the distal convoluted tubule here, and they are going to inhibit the reabsorption of sodium and chloride. Now, obviously, we normally would have sodium reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubule, but if we inhibit that process, what's gonna to happen to that sodium? It's gonna remain in the tubule system, and what do we know about the water? Well, the water is also going to remain in the tubule system and be excreted in the urine. And so that's how the thiazide drugs work, very similar to the loop diuretics, but there's one big difference. So the vast majority of water reabsorption occurs in the loop of Henle. So there's a huge amount of water reabsorption here. So that means we have a lot more ability to affect fluid balance by using a drug that acts in the loop. That's why if somebody has peripheral edema, we would use a loop diuretic because we can cause the, the excretion of more water with this type of diuretic. There's not near as much uh, regulation of water balance in the distal convoluted tubule, so thiazides are not going to have near as much of an effect on fluid balance as the loop diuretics. And so if we have an individual who has high blood pressure, but they do not have peripheral edema, that's where we're going to see more of the thiazide drugs used, because we're not going to be able to affect fluid balance as much in the DCT as we would in the loop. And so acting in the loop is going to allow us to get rid of peripheral edema, not as much with the thiazides acting at the DCT. So the major indication for these would be hypertension without peripheral edema in the extremities. And you can see a few of those drugs shown right here. Um, another note is that the thiazides, through a mechanism we won't talk about here, can also lead to severe hypokalemia. And so what we see is that both the thiazides and the loop diuretics can lead to hypokalemia, so dangerously low potassium levels. 
So it would be nice if we could combine these with another drug that might actually spare potassium, and you might be able to see where we're going. And this is the final class of diuretics. These are called potassium sparing diuretics. These are very weak diuretics. So by themselves, they will not really do much in terms of diuresis, so getting rid of water. So they're typically used in conjunction with a thiazide or with a loop diuretic. And why would they do that? Well, both of these drugs, thiazides and loop diuretics, lead to hypokalemia, so low potassium in the blood. Well, if we can combine it with a potassium sparing diuretic, we can still get the diuretic effect but we can do so without losing so much potassium because these are potassium sparing. So these are drugs that will normally act on this protein here uh, near the distal convoluted tubule, and they inhibit it. Now what would this transporter do in the absence of a diuretic? So what does it do normally? Well, it facilitates sodium reabsorption into the blood, and so some water will also follow that, but because it's only one to two percent of sodium, it's going to be very little water, so it's a very weak water reabsorption here. Okay, And then it's also going to facilitate, notice, potassium secretion into the tubules. So normally it will facilitate potassium moving from the blood into the tubules, and then potassium will be excreted. So what do you think is going to be the effect of one of these potassium-sparing diuretics, like spironolactone, which we often use in heart failure? Well spironolactone or any one of these potassium sparing diuretics is going to inhibit this transporter, right? They're going to inhibit this transporter. And by doing that, they're going to prevent sodium reabsorption. So sodium will remain in the tubules, but they will also inhibit potassium secretion. And so by doing this, these potassium sparing diuretics will allow this potassium to remain in the blood which can reduce the degree of potassium loss due to the loop diuretics and the thiazides. And so the individual will not be as hypokalemic as they might be in the absence of a potassium sparing diuretic. So by themselves, these are very weak diuretics, but they're usually used to retain as much potassium as possible because these two classes of drugs result in a lot of loss of potassium. Now, one other note here, this is a steroid hormone called aldosterone. Aldosterone is secreted by the adrenal cortex here atop the kidney. And aldosterone will actually stimulate more of these transporters to be put into the distal convoluted tubule right here. Okay, And so if more of these transporters were put in, there would be more potassium secretion and more potassium elimination, right? Well, it turns out that in particular, spironolactone, in addition to being able to directly inhibit this transporter, also inhibits the aldosterone receptor. So aldosterone is not able to act and therefore is not able to cause more of these transporters to be put in the DCT. Okay, so it actually has a double effect there. And ultimately, that will allow more potassium to stay in the blood. So what you can see here with these diuretics is overall what they're doing is they are causing more sodium to remain in the tubules and then water follows salt. So if more sodium is in the tubules, more water is in the tubules, the water continues on through the tubules and goes out into the urine. And if we rid the body of more water, the blood volume goes down, and remember that means the blood pressure also goes down. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the mechanisms of these diuretics and why exactly they would be used. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.